Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And perhaps the title for this video clued you in on its topic. We are talking about a warrior woman today. This video was suggested in the comment section of my Talhofer video, which I will be leaving linked up here, and it was suggested by Erica Lewis. Thank you so much for thinking of this fascinating woman as a subject for a video. She is famous, infamous, and certainly mythologised for being Ireland's pirate queen. Let's talk about Grace O'Malley. So it is starting to feel somewhat repetitive, but as with so many of the other female figures that I have looked at on this channel, the early life of Grace O'Malley, or as she is known better in Ireland, Gronuel, is so obscure. We're not sure when she's born. Some people give as a date of birth circa 1530, and as a date of death circa 1603. We aren't sure when she's born, and we aren't sure when she dies. However, these dates do make her a contemporary of Elizabeth I. Indeed, if we go by the 1530 date, then she is just three years older than her English contemporary. What we do know of her early life is as follows. Her mother Margaret and father Owen were both members of the O'Malley family out of County Mayo, albeit, of course, different branches of that family. Owen, her father, was a chief lord of the Upper Owl. In her mid-teens, Grace is married for the first time to Donald O'Flaherty of the Conmara O'Flaherty's who resided in County Galway. By him, she had three children, two sons, Owen and Mora, and a daughter, Margaret. Presumably, these children, the eldest and the younger, being named after her mother and father. At some point, and we aren't sure of the exact date, Gronuel is widowed before remarrying with one Richard Burke. He was the designated successor of MacWilliam Burke, then chief of the Burkes of Lower Connaught, County Mayo. This second marriage brought another child, Theobald or Tybald. He was known as Toby of the Ships because, apparently, he was born to his mother while she was sailing. Indeed, the day after his birth, so the story goes, the ship was attacked by Algerian pirates. Gronuel's men apparently went down to her cabin, where they found her holding her newborn baby in her arms. They begged her to come onto deck so that she might rally her men behind her so they could defend their ship against these aggressors. It would seem, according to the story, that it worked because they did defend their ship and they saw off the Algerian pirates. Gronuel is captaining her ship while pregnant, labouring and then postpartum. And this feels outstanding, unusual, and perhaps it is for her to be in this condition. But why is she on board ship? Well, she is known as Ireland's Pirate Queen, but I think this requires some clarification. Gronuel comes from a seafaring family, the O'Malley's, and at this time in Ireland and also in the wider world, I think it's important to remember that there is a very, very fine line between various seafaring activities. The overseas trader, the privateer and the pirate are sometimes indistinguishable. Similarly, if we look at Elizabeth's England, many of her explorers, who she also called privateers, would, in the eyes of the Spanish, be little more than pirates. Piracy, or otherwise, is, it seems, in the eye of the beholder. What is clear from the records is that Gronuel has access to an enormous fleet of ships. They are quick, agile and able to fight, both in an aggressive attacking context, but also defensively if necessary. So now I've made a few references to records about Gronuel, and I'm going to unpack what I mean by that and also what these records say in a moment but to point out just where they sit in the historical timeline. As I mentioned at the start of this video, Gronuel's date of birth is given as around 1530. This is something that her biographer, Anne Chambers, agrees with, and I will leave Chambers's book, a link to it, in the description box down below. However, 
In her Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry, the author of that, Mary O'Dowd, does not give circa 1530 as a date of birth. Indeed, she lists FL, which means flourishing, or arguably when she appears in the historical record, and specifically the historical record as it is kept by the English government. Mary O'Dowd lists this FL date as being between 1577 and 1597. So what happens in 1577? Well, this document is produced. This document represents the first extant reference to Gronuel in the English record. It is an account written by Sir Henry Sidney, the then Lord Deputy of Ireland, to his London contact, Sir Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's chief spymaster. In this account, he talks about meeting Gronuel for the first time. Of their meeting, he says the following. There came to me also a most famous feminine sea captain called Granny Imali, and offered her services unto me, wheresoever I would command her, with three galleys and two hundred fighting men, either in Scotland or in Ireland. She brought with her her husband. This, we think, refers to Richard Burke, her second husband, for she was as well by sea as by land well more than Mrs. Mate with him. He also says... This was a notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland. Within weeks of this 1577 missive being penned, it would appear that Gronuel is arrested by the Earl of Desmond, Gerald Fitzgerald. There is some reference made to her and her fleet plundering his land. He arrests her and keeps her incarcerated, moving her all around Ireland, and it seems she is not released until early 1579. After her release, we think in the spring of 1579, Gronuel sort of falls from the historical timeline, or rather, more appropriately, she falls out of the English records that deal with her. She does not reappear in these records, and therefore into our view, until 1586. We aren't sure what befalls her between 1579 and 1586, therefore. However, we do believe that in this time, her second husband, Richard Burke, passes away. We think in 1583. So what happens in 1586 that brings Gronuel back to England's attention, and therefore, for us, back to the historical record of her? Well, to understand that we have to hop back two years to 1584. At this time, Sir Richard Bingham is made Governor of Connaught. Bingham was one of Elizabeth's soldiers in Ireland. And we don't quite know what Gronuel or her family thinks of Bingham, but certainly for at least two years there is no overt uprising from Gronuel against Bingham. This all changes in 1586. Bingham's brother, his name is variously given as George or John, he is a sea captain. And in 1586 he is responsible for killing Gronuel's oldest son, Owen. Clearly, and perhaps understandably, Gronuel would be very distressed by this. For Richard Bingham, however, he sees her as seeking vengeance. And in 1586 and 1588, Sir Richard Bingham names Gronuel as being involved in the Burke rebellions against him. He also says that she is bringing in Scottish mercenaries to fight her cause. And 1588 is a particularly tumultuous year in England. It is the year of the Spanish Armada. Many people in Elizabeth's government were very concerned that Ireland would be the perfect launching pad for a Spanish invasion of England during the Armada. Somebody bringing in mercenaries, Scottish or otherwise, to disrupt English rule in the area would therefore be viewed with suspicion, distrust and, of course, a large amount of fear. We must remember that at her birth, Gronuel is born into a powerful family in County Mayo. Through her first marriage and the children born from it, she then has a vested interest in the goings-on in County Galway. And equally, in her second marriage to another powerful man from County Mayo, with a son being produced, she has more interest there. As the Governor of Connaught, which includes Mayo and Galway, Sir Richard Bingham has power over her interests. The animosity that exists between Gronuel's family and Bingham is therefore concerning. Should Bingham so choose, he may jeopardise their futures, their power, and maybe even their physical safety. He jeopardises not only Gronuel, but her children. And it would seem that she felt the risk was getting too great in 1593. 
when she makes a particularly daring move. Between June and September 1593, Gronuel was in England, seeking an audience with Elizabeth I. And at some point in that time, we believe July, she succeeded and the two women met. Unsurprisingly, this meeting is the stuff of myth and legend. So much so that it's nearly impossible to say what exactly occurred, apart from the fact that the meeting took place and that the two women spoke in Latin. The reason for them conversing in Latin is also up for debate and discussion. In her entry on Gronuel for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, Mary O'Dowd asserts that this meeting had to take place in Latin because Gronuel could not speak English. The common language she shared with Elizabeth was Latin, and that is why they had to use it. However, her biographer, Anne Chambers, states differently. She is certain that Gronuel could speak and understand English, and she says the following. That she understood and spoke English as well as Gaelic is evidenced from her face-to-face -face meetings with notable statesmen of the period, including William Cecil, Lord Burley, Sir John Perrott, Lord Henry Sidney, his son, the famous poet courtier soldier Sir Philip Sidney, and with Queen Elizabeth I, whom she met in Greenwich in 1593. And while Anne Chambers makes a strong argument here, all of the people that she lists absolutely could speak and understand Latin. So the conversations that Gronuel is listed as having had with them could also have taken place in Latin. So we can't be sure that she can speak and understand English. Nevertheless, in 1593, Gronuel is in England, preparing to meet Queen Elizabeth I. And here are some letters from July of 1593, around the time that we believe this meeting took place. Here we have Gronuel's petition to Queen Elizabeth I about settling her claims to maintenance that is made in July 1593. In it, she defends her military might and activities, saying, by means of the continual discord, stirs and dissension that heretofore long time remained among the Irish, especially in West Connaught by the seaside, every chieftain for his safeguard and maintenance and for the defense of his people, followers and country, took arms by strong hand to make head against his neighbors, which in like manner constrained your highness fond subject to take arms and by force to maintain herself and her people by sea and land the space of 40 years past. She goes on to talk about her marriages, her children and the fact that she has been twice widowed. She tells Elizabeth that it has yet to be determined, quote, what maintenance she ought to have of her former husband's lands and by the same is restrained to use her former course to her utter decay and ruin. Essentially, she is telling Elizabeth that she is willing to put up her arms and stop fighting with her neighbours if Elizabeth can determine how much maintenance she is supposed to have from the lands of her husband. She is calling upon Elizabeth to determine her inheritance and therefore the inheritance of her children. She wants her queen to step in on her behalf to ensure their future security and safety. Also in July 1593, Gronuel is presented with 18 questions that she must answer for her queen. The questions are as follows. Number one, who was her father and mother? Number two, who was her first husband? Number three, what son she had by him? What be their names and where they live? Number four, what countries they have to maintain them withal? Five, to whom they be married? Number six, what kin was O'Flaherty, her first husband, to Samora O'Flaherty that is here now at the court? Number seven, to answer the like things for her second husband and for his sons and their livings. Number eight, if she were to be allowed her dower or thirds of her husband's living, of what value the same might be of? Number nine, where upon the composition of Connaught there have been any provisions for the wives? Number ten, whether it be not against the customs of Ireland for the wives to have more after the death of their husbands than they brought with them. Number 11. How she hath had maintenance and living since her last husband's death. Number 12. Of what kindred is Walter Burr Fitztibbalds and Shane Burke McMoyler to her son? 13. What captains and countries lie next to her husband's possessions? 14. Who doth possess the house of Morisk upon the seaside in Al O'Malley. 15. What lands doth MacGibbon possess in that country? 16. 
Who doth possess the country named Caramore and Main Connell? 17. Who doth possess the island of Akil and Kill Castle? 18. What kin was her last husband to Walter and Ulick Burke? Gronuel answers the 18 questions and her responses are detailed in this document. It's a relatively long document and I'm not going to go into the answer she gives here mostly because I've already talked about them. Much of what we know about her early life, her parents, her marriages have been drawn out of the answer she gives here. We may not know her exact date of birth. She may not be detailed in the historical record that we have before 1577, but at least the narrative that we do have is one that she has been able to shape and have at least a degree of control over. Elizabeth I was sufficiently charmed by Gronuel at their meeting that she granted what she asked for. Unfortunately, once Gronuel returned to Ireland, it would seem that Sir Richard Bingham was keen to undermine the agreement that Elizabeth had made. In April and May of 1595, Gronuel was once again petitioning Elizabeth that she may have the relief she had been promised. There is no recorded response. In the seemingly unanswered petitions made by Gronuel in 1595, is it possible that Elizabeth is being dismissive? That she made promises face to face two years previously that she never intended to follow through on? Well, that's a little unfair, I think, because by 1595, it's possible that Elizabeth is simply preoccupied, with the massive rebellion being launched by Hugh O'Neill, the Earl of Tyrone. Indeed, to quell this rebellion, Elizabeth sends her favourite, the Earl of Essex, and he spectacularly fails to put down this rebellion. Indeed, his failure is one of the precipitating events to his ultimate fall and execution. So I am not prepared to say that these seemingly unanswered petitions of 1595 is evidence that the meeting between Queen Elizabeth I and Gronuel in 1593 didn't go well. I think it's entirely possible that they could go unanswered and yet Elizabeth could still be impressed by Gronuel and concerned by her plight. Grace O'Malley, Gronuel, famed and mythologized pirate queen of Ireland, is also clearly a skilled diplomat and negotiator, who is, at the same time, not beyond using violence to get her way. She is the daughter of leaders, the wife of leaders, and the mother of leaders, but also clearly a leader in her own right, both on land and at sea. She manages ships, men-at-arms, and mercenaries, and also controls her land, she maintains the legacy for herself and the inheritance for her children. She is absolutely involved in piratical activities and raiding, but also profitable trade by sea. Yes, she is a pirate, but she is also so much more. A woman of education and intellect who can move freely amongst her people, her soldiers, but also at Elizabeth's court. To us, unfortunately, she will always be a little ephemeral. We will always be seeing her mostly through somebody else's eyes. So I'd love to know what you think of this video and what you think of the story of Grace O'Malley, Gronuel. Also, if there's another warrior woman that you would like me to make another video on, then please do let me know in the comments section down below or come and tell me over on my social media. I'll leave the links in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue the conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.